All right, welcome to the fourth video in our series for Business Law 2 on contract formation, right? Um, we've been introduced to uh, Article 2, which covers the sale of goods. So now I'd like to introduce us, I think I mentioned this before, to 2A. Uh, Section 2A of the UCC deals with leases of goods, right? And the distinction between a sale and a lease is that while a sale involves the transfer of title, a lease involves the transfer of the right to hold, possess, or use the goods, right? And so the provisions of Article 2A will generally track, in many ways it's a repeat of the Uniform Commercial Code provisions under Article 2 that relate to sales of goods, right? There are some distinctions. Um, and part of that, well, Article 2A, um, so uh, any uh, covers any transaction that creates a lease of goods as well as a sublease of goods. Um, and it applies to leases rather than sales. Um, and so the differences will try to reflect some of the distinctions between sale and lease transactions. For example, the right to use and possess will be transferred and then transferred back unless there's a sale at the end of that lease transaction. Um, so Article 2A defines a lease agreement as a bargain between a lesser and a lessee with respect to the lease of goods as found in their language and as implied by other circumstances, including course of dealing, uses of trade, and course of performance. That's UCC 2A 103 uh, sub 1 and then sub K. Subs are just the parentheticals. Um, so 2A103, the person who is the lessor, L-E-S-S-O-R, the person who is granting the lease, they transfer the right to use and possession under the of the goods. And the person who is the L lessee, L-E-S-E-E, -E -E, is the person who acquires the right to temporary possession and use of the goods. Um, so the lessee is the party who's leasing the goods from the lessor, and the lessor is obviously the person who's, like the landlord it would be in a real estate transaction, the landlord is a lessor, and the person who is acquiring the right to use the apartment is the lessee, right? So th this is the sort of the same in the, in, the, um, in the world of the Uniform Commercial Code generally. Um, we should make a note here that there is the additional concept of a consumer lease here, uh, dealing with certain types of leases, just as uh, certain provisions apply specifically to transactions involving merchants, other types of, uh, uh, of provisions may relate specifically to commercial leases. Um, it's sort of a similar category because it's involving uh, business people who are in the business of uh, engaging in that type of lease with consumers. Um, so first, the, the definition of a consumer lease. It, in, it involves in, in a, a lessor, a party, who regularly engages of, in the business of leasing and selling things, right? And it involves a lessee who is using it primarily for personal family or household purpose. So it's not a lease involving, it's not a business to business lease, would not be a consumer lease. And lastly, the total lease payments are less than the dollar amount set by state statute because it's really in, intended to uh, be directed at individual consumers. So there'll be you know something in the five figure range. Uh, that generally uh, ensure special protection for individual consumers. Um, and certain provisions under the UCC apply only to those leases that are consumer leases. So they really are looking at transactions by uh, uh, businesses with individuals up to that certain threshold dollar amount. Uh, for example, one provision says that a consumer may recover attorney's fees if a court finds that a term in a consumer lease contract is unconscionable, right? So if they find unconscionability, which is a concept you may have been exposed to when we talked about um, defenses to contract, well, when you would have talked about defenses to contract enforcement in business law one, right? In this case, this is a fee shifting and not the most common 
feature in legal disputes. It's a fee-shifting feature. Uh, so it is something that we should be aware of. It's something that should guide those who are creating consumer leases or entering into um, consumer leases. So now that we've looked at the, the two uh, main branches of this uh, contract formation, right, the lease and sale, so as we've divided it for this purpose, um, let's talk a little bit more about how these contracts come together. So you guys are familiar with the idea of offer, acceptance, consideration, capacity, and legality, right? Or as the, the this uh, Miller text phrases it, agreement, capacity, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, agreement, consideration, capacity, and legality, right? I, I break it down a little differently because you know I, I think it's five parts rather than four, uh, but. Uh, and in fact, when we go back to look at the the uh, the pieces uh, of how a contract comes together under the UCC, we see that it is broken down by offer and acceptance, right? As well as consideration, capacity, and legality, all right? So uh, we'll start with the offer. And uh, well, as a preface, we should note that you're free to you still have freedom of contract. The UCC doesn't limit your contract options. You can certainly. Uh, Within certain uh, limitations under the law, there are things that are, are not contractable, that are not legally recognized or which are, in fact, illegal, right? But other than that, you're free to make any deal that you want. And so we start with the, with the idea that there is freedom of contract. Um, and we know that in an offer, the offer is the, is the promise that is made by an offeror or the promisor, right, uh, that is conditional upon the person whom, to whom the offer is being made, again, the offeree, accepting it unequivocally and returning, generally in the case of a bilateral contract, returning a promise um, in return that is that the, basically requested by the offeror basically promising to fulfill that return promise which is that and that inducement is the consideration right um, so under uh, contract law we know that that offer has to be has to have definiteness to it we need to understand what its terms are it needs to have definite terms we need to know who the potential parties are going to be we need to know what the contract is about um, it has to be definite enough for any third party to be able to tell what it is that the essential terms are at the time that the contract was accepted. The UCC provides some normative assumptions that take away some of the need for this definiteness of terms. And I don't want to overemphasize that. You still need to be able to understand what the contract is about. So there are two conditions under which the Uniform Commercial Code will not find an offer fails for indefiniteness, right? You can have an open term in a contract that would otherwise fail for indefiniteness, right? Um, if one, the parties intended to make a contract at the time, or two, and two, right, there's a reasonably certain basis for the court to grant an appropriate remedy, right? So if they intended to make a contract and there's a, a reasonably uh, certain basis for the court to grant an appropriate re remedy, then under the UCC 2-204 sub 3, right, so under UCC 2-204, or UCC 2A-204, parallel provision, right? That contract will not fail just because there is an open term that would otherwise cause it to be found indefinite. Again, if the parties have to have intended to make a contract and there has to be a reasonably certain basis for the court to grant an appropriate remedy. And so you ask, does that leave us open to some uncertainty in a UCC-based contract? Well, you have to keep in mind that the Uniform Commercial Code has a number of normative assumptions that, are, that it uses uh, to uh, 
uh, and those normative assumptions are based in how business has been conducted over the last umfa number of years uh, throughout history, um, before these things were codified, right? So there are a number of provisions in the UCC that deal with specifically situations where there would otherwise be an indefinite term, what we call an open term. Um, and, and so those other provisions may be used to sort of be a fill-in where there might be a situation with an open term. So let's take a couple of, of these open terms and, and look at them a little bit more specifically. First, there is the open price term. And so there are two primary situations where an open price term might become an issue between parties to a contract. One of those is that the parties simply omit a price term, right? And the other would be where acceptance occurs and one party or the other is to set the price and the price is not set, right? Uh, until that person sets the price, right? So if it's, it's, it's a, if it's the first situation, and, and both of these situations are dealt with under UCC 2-305, right? So this provides our rules. It's, it's in many ways, uh, statutory work is much uh, easier in some respects because you get your rule outlined for you. UCC 2-305, the court can set a reasonable price at the time of delivery if the, the open price term results from the parties not a, agreeing on a price and performance has commenced. So you get the delivery, they never set a price, they agreed to a contract, and they, uh, there's a reasonably certain basis because we know that if the court can find a reasonable, a reasonable price at the time for delivery, right, including a reasonable profit, then the then it can resolve the dispute if the dispute is overpriced. That's UCC 2-305 sub 1. And then the second provision, UCC 2-305 sub 2, um, means that the, where the party, one party or the other, let's say that the buyer sets the price, right? Or the seller sets the market price. Let's say, let's say it's fish delivery, right? The seller... The, 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 the buyer is a fish market and the seller is a fish wholesaler, right? And they get different selections based on different availability. And so they bring fresh fish in and they set certain, for certain items, they set the price uh, based on supply and demand, right? Uh, that's a good faith. If that's done in good faith, right, then the contract is a solid contract despite the fact that there is an open price term because the, the if the price is set in good faith then that meets the requirements of UCC 2-305 sub 2. All right so we've looked at the two situations where an open price term would be most likely um, to become an issue right where the parties don't agree uh, or they fail to, they just omit a price term, or where one party is supposed to provide a price. What about the situation where a party, as a part of this, has failed to perform, right, in their obligation to set the price? Uh, the UCC provides another provision, uh, UCC 2-305 sub 3, that handles this situation. So, Perez and Merrick enter into a contract for the sale of unfinished doors and agree that Perez will determine the price. Perez refuses to specify the price, right? Merrick, the manufacturer, let's say, can either treat the contract as canceled or they can just set a reasonable price and perform, right? So that's a very specific situation. Uh, that's not going to happen uh, as often as the other two, perhaps. Uh, but there are other provisions that are dealt with similarly. Um, open payment terms. Um, if they don't specify payment, payment is due at the place at which the buyer is to receive the goods. It's the most common uh, way in which parties do business, even outside of the world of the UCC, and historically have done so. So uh, that's UCC 3. 2-310 sub A.
another issue respecting payment is timing and then how payment is to be made. In the case where uh, there is no specified means in the contract, payment may be made by any reasonable commercial means, right? That means they can use cash, they can use check, they can use a, a credit card if it's available, right? Um, if the buyer specifies that it must be in cash, then there must be a reasonable amount of time to obtain that cash. That's UCC 2-511 sub 2. Um, open delivery terms. Uh, if there is no delivery term uh, specified, then the buyer normally takes delivery at the seller's place of business, right? Um, just think about it. That's typically how most commercial transactions would occur anyway. Um, regarding uh, re regarding uh, goods, right? Most goods are obtained from the sellers, well, for most of us, right? Most goods are obtained from the seller's place of business. Maybe that's changing a little more now. Uh, that, that delivery is, is, the, is the norm, but traditionally. Um, and there are a number of these rules um, that are detailed in the book. I would, you know, just also uh, draw your specific, specific attention to open quantity terms, right? Um, open quantity terms are a, a, are a little bit different. In most cases, um, if the parties don't specify a quantity, there is no contract, right? Because there's no basis for supplying a remedy. But there are exceptions to that. Um, generally speaking, there's almost no way to for a court to determine what a reasonable quantity of goods would be for someone to buy. So if I say, I want I know, widgets for my store, right? I don't know. How big is your store? How many widgets would you have ex reasonably expected to sell, right? What would the normal widget order look like? Uh, there's no way to really tell that. Um, uh, there are some, uh, some exceptions uh, that the UCC provides for. In the case of requirements contracts, so a requirements contract uh, is a contract where the buyer agrees to buy their necessary uh, uh, acquisitions of a certain product. Right. They need to get a certain product into their possession. Um, and, and so the seller agrees to sell the buyer and the buyer agrees to buy right, all or up to a stated amount of what the buyer needs. Right? And that need might fluctuate. Right? But in the course of a uh, contract, there may be um, ways to tell what a reasonable amount um might be so an example in one example a cannery forms a contract with al garcia the cannery agrees to purchase from garcia and garcia agrees to sell to the cannery all of the green beans that the cannery needs or requires during the following summer there is an implicit consideration in the contract because the buyer which is the cannery gives up the right to buy goods from any other seller uh, this forfeited right creates a legal detriment something that they're exchanging in, in sort of like a consideration, right? Um, and that consideration is enough to bind that contract, even though there is no, you know, we want two tons of green beans per month, right? That's not present, right? But we do know that we may buy two tons in May, we may buy 1.7 tons in, you know, June, so on and so forth. We may buy 2.3 tons in July. Uh, and I don't even know the seasons for these products, so I just uh, pardon that. But the point is that that, that, that um, since they're so common in the business world and they're kind of necessary to commerce um, to uh, induce certain buyers and sellers to be able to deal with them. So, um, uh, so they, they will infer a... Uh, a, a good faith um, limitation on requirements contracts as they will for output contracts. And an output contract, the seller agrees to sell and the buyer agrees to buy all or up to a stated amount of what the seller produces, right? So in the, uh, in the example, Ruth uh, has planted two acres of organic tomatoes, uh, a local restaurant agrees to buy all of the tomatoes that Sewell produces that year to use at the restaurant. Again, because the seller essentially forfeits the right to, to sell goods to another buyer, there's an implicit 
consideration of an output contract, and the UCC imposes a good faith limitation on requirements and output contracts. The quantity under such contracts is basically the amount of the requirements or the amount of the output that occurs during a normal production year. Um, the actual quantity purchased or sold cannot be unreasonably disproportionate to the normal or comparable requirements or output as the case may be, right? So if I produce, you know, triple the number of tomatoes the following year by some amount, right? Um, it might be a point where we would have to look, does the, re does the restaurant need that many um, of that uh, particular product, right? Was that a part of the consideration? We knew that she was producing one third of the amount, right? On the land that she had at the time. And then she, you know, through science, right, is able to triple that, or through acquisitions, is able to increase her capacity, uh, does that uh, impact my business and force me to buy more tomatoes? There's a limit on that, all right? Uh, check, take a look at the prompt, and I'll see you in the next segment.